So what I'm going to be talking about today is going to tie in with some of the things that we've been talking about and singing about. We're singing about the storm. How does the song go? Something about through every storm. My soul will sing. And we're going to be talking about that today. We've been talking about built to win. And uh, John has used uh, illustrations about guns. And I love guns. And Pastor Eric is witness to that. You know. Well, should I say that? Because this is Canada, you know. <laughs> oh, this is a men's conference. So we, uh, we, we can. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> you know. If I get a tape, I'll edit this part out for my wife when she's listening. <laughs> you know, talked about guns, talked about cars. You know, today I'm going to talk about dealing with obstacles. We're built to win, but there are obstacles that would come in life that would make us feel like we're not built for this thing. We're not built for this Christian life. We're not built to succeed. We're not built to be anything of what? There are obstacles that would look insurmountable. There are things that would happen in life that would make us doubt ourselves. Recently, I was speaking with a man who is a professional, has got multiple degrees, and the person said to me that they feel incompetent. That person said, I feel incompetent. I feel that I cannot do the job that I'm doing, I feel that I don't even know who I am. Life sometimes throws things at us that we want to just throw in the towel and just quit. What do we have to do? We need to deal with those obstacles. The path that God has set before us is sure, and we need to walk it. But there's a way to walk it and deal with the obstacles that come against us. Look at our example, Jesus. Did he have obstacles? On the way to the cross, did he have obstacles? He did. And what did he do? Did he quit? He wanted to quit. Do you remember the garden, the prayer he did? Father, let this cup pass over me. Let this cup pass over me. Why? Why would he want that? Because the, 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 the challenge that is in front of him is huge. But you know what he did? He surrendered his will to the Lord. And the Bible tells us that he learned he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Yeah. He surrendered himself to the will of God. But before we talk about that, I'm going to talk about something that I think we need to understand to really help us to grasp this. And that is what God created us to be. What God makes, made us to be. God's original intent and intention for our lives. So if you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and that's going to be our opening passage today. Ephesians chapter 2, if I can find it. Ephesians chapter 2, oh, I can quote it. So I just got a new Bible and it doesn't, it's, 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 I'm getting used to it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse, we're going to read verse 10. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, for which God, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I want us to slowly read that. It says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that we should walk in them. And a lot of times when we think about this, we need to clearly remind ourselves of this fact, where is workmanship. Workmanship basically means where is masterpieces, where is best work. When God was creating you, when God was creating you in Christ Jesus, he was doing his best work yet. You know, what do you do with masterpieces? What do you do? You put your masterpiece, you, you, you display it in a prominent place. It's a place where you want people to see it. You want to showcase your work. That's who you are in Christ Jesus. The Bible says you are a masterpiece. You can tell your neighbor, say, I'm a masterpiece. 
You know, I am God's masterpiece. I am God's best work. You know, if we wake up every morning and you stand in front of the mirror and you say, this is God's best work. There goes God's best work. It does something to you. It changes your attitude about life and the challenges that you face. It changes your attitude about the decisions that you make in life. You know, if you keep meditating on this kind of stuff and when sin and temptation comes, it's hard to think, I'm God's masterpiece, yet I'm going to indulge in sin. It just doesn't fit. That's, God wouldn't create a, a creature that can't say no to sin. Hello? He creates us with the ability to live the life that he's called us to live. So we're God's masterpiece. That's exactly what we are. But I want to talk about that just a little bit. What does that mean? It means that God created you to have everything you have that pertains to life, and that pertains to godliness. And we can go into it in, in the letter of Peter. It tells us about this. It says his divine power has given us all things that pertain to what? Life and godliness. Now there's a teaching that is out there. A lot of people teach about destiny and what God, you got to pursue your destiny. You got to go and chase your destiny. And you got to go. And what does, what does that tell you? It tells you that you got to go do something so that you can be something. That's not a Christian teaching. It's a Buddhist teaching. Hello? It fits more in Buddhism where you got to keep going until you get to that place, the enlightenment, the place of enlightenment. Then you have arrived. Then you become the Buddha. That's not Christianity. In our faith, the day we were born again, we were created in Christ Jesus as God's masterpiece. Glory to God. That very day, the day you got saved and, you know, you, you, you were a mess, you were crying and everybody's like, it's okay. Like, oh, you know, that very moment, you were God's masterpiece. He said, but I didn't know anything. I didn't know, I didn't know the word. I didn't know, I wasn't even spirit filled yet. I didn't know anything. I was still smoking. I was still, you know, I still wanted to go back to my old girlfriend. That very moment that you became born again, you became God's masterpiece. You became the best that God has ever made. And then Christian keep hearing messages that tell them that they have to pursue their destiny. What destiny? What destiny do you have to pursue? What could be out there that is more than what's in there? Hello? What could be out there that we want to go and say, oh yeah, I've arrived at my destiny. No, the day I got saved, I arrived at my destiny. You know, it's really shameful, I think, and I know shameful is a strong word, because Christians go out there and tell people that all they need is Jesus. True? Then they come to their little Bible studies, and they say, well, you need to go do this, and then you need, in order to be fulfilled, you need to do this, and in order to let, let God like you more, you got to do this, and, and you got to do this, and you got to do this. And then people say to me, Philemon chapter 1 verse 6, which is one of my passages for later today, they said to me, oh, that passage says that if we share our faith with other people, then it will become effective. I said, if you have to share your faith for it to be effective, it's not worth having. You should have an effective faith, and the effectiveness of it is why you're sharing it. Hello? See, if we need to add anything to Jesus for us to be fulfilled, then we've got the wrong Jesus. The Jesus that I have, the Jesus that I met, the day I got saved, that was enough. They could have, called, they could have said, oh, the game is over, let's go to heaven, and I would just be as satisfied. Oh, but Moses, how about the people that have gotten saved since then through you? Glory to God. Those were just the output of an already fulfilled life. Seeing people saved doesn't bring me more fulfillment. Oh, do I want people saved? Trust me, I do. 
Do I want people to be discipled? Trust me, I do. But I recognize one thing, that all that I need for my sustenance, all that I need for my fulfillment is Jesus Christ in me, Christ in me. So now, if you look at in Genesis chapter 1, it says, let us make man in our own image, verse 26. Let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness, and let them, what? Have dominion. What comes first? What makes man, man? Was it that man went out and said, hey, fish, come out of the water, and the fish jumped right up? Is that what makes him a man? Is that what gave him the authority? What makes him who God made him? The fact that God made him that. If Adam, the day he was created, went to sleep, while he was sleeping, he's still the person that God made him. He didn't have to go out to the world and have dominion to become a man. So people say, well, but that's his destiny to go have dominion. No, no. Having dominion is an outflow of who he was. Same thing is true about us as believers. Our destiny is not what we do. Our destiny is who we are. Our destiny is who we are. The Bible says that in Romans chapter 8, it says he has predestinated us to be what? To be conformed to the image of his son. That's your destiny, to be conformed to the image of God's son. And when did that happen? When you were born again. That moment, that boom happens. So if we understand that, we can go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and understand that we are his masterpiece. We're not, we're not a miracle going somewhere to happen. We are miracles, period. We're not work in progress, you know. And I do I, I understand that we're growing, we're maturing. But I'm telling us the truth about us. And as John explained to us in the morning, all these things happen to us in our born-again spirit. Our spirit is made perfect. Everything is done, completed. Sealed, ready, delivered on the inside of us. That's the reality. But I don't want us to get into the place where we say, well, we are positionally his workmanship. You know what that means? We are sort of his workmanship positionally, but in reality, uh, we're not. We're messed up. Do you, do you see what I mean? That's what Christians, that's what Christians think. But I want us to think of this that we are his workmanship, we are his masterpieces. Then if we understand that, let's look at the second part of that verse. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand, well, that we should walk in them. And I want us to think about it that way. So we are created unto good works. But what did it say about the good works? It said that God is prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But first, you have to be a masterpiece to be able to walk in them. Walking in them is not what makes you the masterpiece. Being the masterpiece is why you walk in them. Do you see this? Nothing that we do changes our status before God. It might change our reward level when we get to heaven, but it doesn't change who we are. Who we are is a function of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. I'm never going to be able to add anything to it. You know, one of, in our book, on, uh, in my book, I wrote a, uh, in the num- uh, chapter 2, we, a poem of mine that I wrote. It says, having Christ satisfies me. The longing of my heart is satisfied. I have no more longing for satisfaction, for fulfillment. It's done. It's sealed. It's delivered. I'm not looking forward to a midlife crisis. It's not going to happen. I'm not looking forward. I I, I have no fear of an identity crisis. I have no fear of those things that people expect you to say, oh, when you get to be of a certain age, you're going to look back on your life and you're going to wonder, oh, did you make all the right decision? Hey, 
2,000 years ago, somebody made all the right decision on my account. And now I can rest in what he did. I can rest confident in what he did. So he said, we have this world created. So what does that mean? I'm God's masterpiece. I'm the best that God has made. But it's made work that I'm going to walk in them. It's kind of like if you are on a movie set, right? The script has been written. You are the winner. Hello? You're the winner. It says, it's, it's, oh, you're, you're rocky, you know, you, you, you're jumping, you, you know, you, you, you're exercising. The script is set. You're going to win the fight anyway. So what does uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone need to do in the movie? Just follow the script. Just follow the script. Just keep following the script. Just keep doing it. Just doing it. So, oh, you know, run up the steps, run back down. Just do it. Oh, it doesn't make sense. I, I've already won. The script says I won. Just do what the script says. That's what this means. You already created. All that God wants you to be is already done. All you need to do is, what does the script say? You know what the script is? The script is the word of God. Amen. So I walk, I, 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 we were, we were, Maybe paintball. So we went paintballing a while ago, and uh, and uh, we were <laughs> no, no, did Harry win? Yeah, he won. He won. But uh, so I, I said a joke to Harry while we're uh, you know shooting guns at each other with paintballs, and uh, you know I said a joke to him, and I forget how the joke went, and it's basically it's like, wow, wouldn't this be? Like, isn't this like how life is? Like, if this is a movie, isn't this like how life is? And he says, like, oh, that's what real life is. Because real life, you know what the script says, and you just keep doing it. And you know who the director is? we got the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. That's telling us, no, no, no. You know, when you get there, this is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to say. This is how you're going to look. This is how you're going to rejoice. And that's what the script says. This is the script. The director lives on the inside of us. So we have been programmed as the winners. We just have to go through the script. You know what happens to a lot of Christians? They quit halfway through it. They quit halfway through it. When I was in high school, I was a sprinter. I was pretty good, but I was not the best in high school. Or, uh, so, but we had this guy who was a long distance runner. And ev in all the tryouts, everybody knew that this guy was able to just run and run and run and run. For the 1500 meters race, it's they, they could have gone and printed his name on the medals because he was going to win. Everybody knew. So you go through the first time, you know, it's a 400 meters, you know, it is 100 meters on each side of the field. You go through the first time and the second time and the third time and three quarters of the way, um, the fourth time, and you win. Everybody knew. So the race started, and we were all looking at, this is the finals. The race started, and everybody is looking at who is going to be second and third. Nobody is looking at the first. The, 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 it's already given to him. Because it, it was the fastest, and by a long short. Right? So what happens was, the race started. And he was going on, of course, the first 400 meters. He usually just hold back, and you know nobody was concerned. And then by the time they're going to 800 meters, he, he was already in the front. And nobody was looking at him anymore. We're looking at who are coming behind him. And all of a sudden, I was looking there. I was, on this, I was a spectator then. I wasn't doing 1,500 meters. I was looking at the, the guy. He just started slowing down, slowing down. And he moved over to the side. And he hunched over and started puking. And I'm like, what's going on? Or oh, maybe it's just going to get up again. And then the others were coming, and they were coming, and they were coming, and they went right past him. And he just stopped. He didn't even try to finish the race with like 300 meters left. He just quit right there on the field. You know, that's what a lot of Christians do. 
Obstacles come their way. They feel discouraged. They feel sick a little bit. Things are happening not the way they want it to happen. So they just get over to the side and they just puke. <laughs> you know, and they just think stuff start coming out of their mouth that shouldn't be coming out of their mouth. Things started, they start confessing things and say, whoa, 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 how can you believe that stuff having been exposed to the word of truth? How can you say the stuff you're saying having been exposed to the word of truth? The reason is, somewhere along the way, obstacles come and they didn't know how to deal with it and they weren't prepared for the race that all they need to do is show up and do what the script says. And we, we went off to the, the guy later, I'm like, what happened? What happened? Well, he had a big meal just before the race started. He knew better. Perhaps he was overconfident. He's like, I'm just 1,500 meters. He wasn't doing what he's supposed to do. What the, when you're preparing for a race, how you prepare yourself, he skipped it and like, I'm going to have another serving of that food. And of course, he handed up on the side of the, on the side of the uh, field. That's what a lot of Christians do. You know, John sixteen in John chapter sixteen, Jesus tells us this. It says, "In the world, we will have tribulations." I've said all these things that is happening to us in our spirit, and it's all good. But Jesus said, "In the world, there's one guarantee: you will have tribulations." He said, "But rejoice." I have overcome the world. Whoa, Jesus, you said, I'm going to have trouble, but I should rejoice because you overcame. That's great. It doesn't make sense, does it? How can I rejoice? It's kind of like, oh, no, tomorrow is going to be really tough, but don't worry, don't worry. I've done that exam before and I passed, but you're going to have a bad exam. That doesn't, doesn't make sense, does it? How can I be happy that I'm going to have trouble because you, how, can I be, how can I know that I'm going to have trouble but I should be happy that I'm having trouble because you had overcome? It doesn't make sense unless you understand new creation truths. You know, this New Testament truths and understand what happened after Jesus resurrected. It says, be of good cheer because I have what? Overcome, overcome what? The world. the world. I have overcome the world. Was there any time that God needed or God and the world were in contest? Was there any time that the world was a competition for God? No, never. So was there any time that God would need to overcome the world? He created the world. He's above the world. So if Jesus had overcome, what could it mean? What could it mean? It would only mean, the only logical and faith answer is that he overcame the world on our behalf. Just as he became sin on the cross, he, he never sinned. He was the only life that sin never touched. Yet, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 to 21, that it became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He overcame the world on our behalf so that his victory can become our victory. So that's why it says rejoice, because the script is already set. I have overcome. So you're going to have obstacles in life. This, there'll be skirmishes, there'll be fights, there'll be battles that's going to happen in life. But rejoice! The victory is preordained. You have already overcome. That's what Jesus was telling them. He said, rejoice! I have overcome the world. You have won! Yes, amen. amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. You have won. There might be, there might be skirmishes. There might be, you might get some bruises sometime, but just stay with the script. Don't drop the script now. 
Don't drop the script now. Don't quit. Don't leave the studio. Keep doing what the word says. Follow the script because at the end, you are the victor. Yes. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. We are the victors. We are the victors. We are the defend. In fact, the reality is whatever situation you're facing in life, you are the defending champion. You are the defending champion. And I've lived this. I have believed this stuff. I wrote that stuff um, about having Christ satisfies me and everything that I ever needed is in Christ Jesus many years ago. Before I was homeless. Before I didn't have anything. Before people around me who had thought I, I look up to spiritually as people that would mentor me say things to me that make me feel like I was under the curse. But I said, no, no, that's not what the script says. The script says, he has redeemed me from the curse, been made a curse for me. For it is reason, written, cursed is he who hanged on the tree. I believe this stuff. Now, when life was hard, when the pain, the pressure of the situation was hard, when tears was a re- were, were relief for me, I believed this stuff. I wrote about it here. I, wrote, you know, I didn't write about it. I'm not a storyteller in that way. But I wrote about what God told me in that moment. Okay, maybe it might be actually, um, what chapter is that? might be a good, yeah, I wrote about it in chapter, uh, on page 108 here. It says, when the storms of life come crashing on you, stand. When the waves of destruction beat on you, stand. When darkness comes and your vision lost, stand. When all you've got seems lost, stand. When hope fades and your strength wanes, stand. When all leave and forsake you, stand. When fear shakes your being, stand. When disappointment comes and tears your only solace, stand. When people deride and blame you, stand. When family and friends become foes, stand. When faith seems lost and victory out of sight, stand. When nothing seems to work, stand. When you have done all you can, stand. When you have done all to stand, stand. And I write it here, stand in God's strength alone. Situation will change, people will change, circumstances will be rearranged, but God's word remains settled. So stand until your change comes. Then keep on standing in your redemption rights and privileges. Stand. The storms and the waves are temporary. They may persist for a time, but they will recede. Weeping may endure for a night, but rejoice. The morning is dawning. Weariness may have overwhelmed your soul, but your rest and strength has come. The light has come. Help is here. The master, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in you. I wrote this at one of the darkest moments in my life. I wrote this at a time where I had no money, nothing. I was living in a, uh, in a house that I couldn't afford the rent. I gave up my car because I couldn't afford to keep paying insurance on it. I, 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 I didn't know what to do. Things were going really bad, it seemed. But I believe the same stuff. I was, I was teaching people how to believe God for stuff. But stuff was not, would look like nothing is working. And then I have a conversation with somebody that, that I trusted. And they just, it's just like, you know, you, you had that moment where you've been standing and standing. And that, that person just tore the strip out of me. It was the last straw. I went home. And as I lay down in bed, I wished that I would not wake up. It has never happened to me in my life. I have had stuff happen, but that moment I, I, I lay down in bed and I wish that I would not wake up. That's distraction. Those are obstacles in life 
That's stuff that happens to Christians and they move over to the side of the road and they start saying stuff that's negative. I kept my mouth closed, though, because I would not declare anything contrary to what the Word of God says. I called a friend of mine. You should have godly friends in your life, people you can turn to in the moment where the darkness is there and you're shaking in your own being that can speak the truth of God's Word in your life. I'm not, I don't look, I'm not looking for worldly wisdom. I'm looking for somebody to remind me of my redemption rights and privileges. I called a friend of mine up. I forgot why, but he just started speaking the word of God into me, and he started reminding me of who I am, and all I could do was weep. All I could do was weep. This was the main meeting. I can, I can talk about it. All I could do was cry, and I got up. I went for a walk, praying in the spirit, just thanking God. Thick darkness. It feels like there's no hope. And then this word started bubbling out of my mind, out of my spirit. And I started speaking it. I started speaking it to myself. And through tears, writing it down, a piece of napkin that I had, that I need to stand. That's what you do when the obstacles of life come. You stand. You deal with obstacles by standing. But how do you stand? You stand by walking in faith. By staying with the script, what would mean the analogy of staying with the script basically means walking by faith, being led by the Spirit. The Word of God is our script. We keep doing what the Word says, no matter what life throws at us. And glory be to God. He has been faithful. I look back to those times I could have quit. I could have subverted my own faith. I could have been on the side of the road and give up on God, give up on faith, give up on believing, just lose it. But no, 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 thank God for his grace. I was able to stand and I'm still standing, glory to God. But that was, that was not the same time as when I had no place to live. I mean, the, when I had no place to live and I actually had to sleep in the Nathan Phillips School, that's when I developed a discipleship program that has helped hundreds of people. I, I don't know. I don't know the number, but you know, this discipleship program has been used now in multiple continents. We have it translated into Mandarin. We have all kinds of stuff that's happened with it. There's, there's at least a church that we know, other than ours, that's using it. Other churches have used it in the past. But I was actually didn't have a job. Didn't have a place to live. I was volunteering as a minister, traveling, doing stuff, but not asking for money to do this stuff. Right? And <laughs> the believing God for my need, but I actually slept outside. Not one day. In the middle of that, all I can think about is walking the script. One of our strongest discipleship program, I wrote it in those days. What if I had quit? What if the pressure had been too much for me to bear and I had quit? The souls that would have been benefited wouldn't be benefiting from me. I was teaching people how to believe God for stuff when all I can do was believe God for my next meal. The same principle applies. The same way I use my faith to believe God for my next meal and my next bus ticket there's the same faith I use to believe God for the stuff that I'm believing God for today. But if I had quit at that time, I would have broken the chain, so to speak. The continuity wouldn't be there. Just like how, how David was able to say, God would deliver me from, that li uh, from, the li from the bear and the lion. The same God will deliver this uncircumcised Philistine into my hands. And when you have quit, if you had quit when the lion showed up and ran away, if you had quit when the bear showed up and ran away, he would not be able to stand. Not that God is saying, oh, you got to do this first. But personally, you wouldn't have your own, you wouldn't have the integrity before yourself to stand on the word of God because you have not followed through earlier on. See, obstacles will come in life. The best will come. The lions will come. Keep standing. The same faith that you used to defeat the lions and the bears is the same faith Amen. that would destroy the Goliath. Yes. Amen. So the first thing we do is we walk by faith. 
we walk in the Spirit, and we all know this is a church, uh, so it is a Bible college that teaches principles like that. We keep doing what the Word says. The next thing we do on the, on the PowerPoint is we rejoice always. Rejoice always. That's what the song we're saying. Uh, my soul will sing, right? When the storm of life, through the storm of life, what am I going to do? My soul is going to sing. What was I doing there when I was exhorting myself? I said, oh, the help has come. The light has come. The darkness is past. What was I doing? I was rejoicing. I'm standing up something on the inside of me. Let me pause a little bit and go back to Philemon chapter 1. There's only one chapter. Verse 6. It says that the, that the communication of your faith might become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you. In Christ Jesus. Thank you. You acknowledge every good thing that is in you. I'm gonna t- I was going to talk about dealing with obstacles, but what was the first thing I did today? The first thing I did is tell you about the good stuff that's in you. You are the masterpiece. He said our faith, the communication, the fellowship of our faith will become effectual by acknowledging the good things that are in us in Christ Jesus. Our faith is not being effective by saying, oh, the mountain, go, go, mountain, go. No, no, no. Acknowledging what's in me. Thank you, Father, that I have authority over demons. I can cast them out. I thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, you lying spirit, come out of him. Did you you see that? What did I do? I acknowledged the good thing that saved me. Jesus stood in the front, in, in the, uh, in the front of, the, of Lazarus' tomb. And it, what did he first say? He said, Father God, I thank you that you have heard me. Yes. Glory to God. What was he saying? He said, I say it not. I say it for the benefit of this people. Yeah. That they may know that you have sent me. And he turned to the tomb of Lazarus and says, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead four days came out of the tomb. Wow! That's somebody who understood what he had. You know, so I was on a plane, and when John called me this week, I was in um, British Columbia, and I was on the plane, and, you know, I was going to, uh, the red-eye flight, I was going to take a nap, but there was a movie that I was curious about, so I, I looked at it, and the opening scene, there was somebody, a, a, a girl who had died. Oh, I'm like, oh, not I'm not going to watch it. So I, I stopped watching the movie and took a, uh, I took a nap through the night. So I came home. <laughs> I was telling Jen, I said, I had a dream that I raised a dead woman. <laughs> you know, so I, was, and I told her the whole dream. And she was wondering, why are you dreaming about raising the dead? You know, and I told her that I just saw this movie. And, and, oh, and she said, and then you just wrote your own alternate ending. Yeah. You know, but what actually happened in that dream was we, we arrived at this person's hospital bed and the person had died. And I looked and I said, oh, she's dead. So I went away. And then somebody wrote an email and said, Oh, this person has been teaching about the power of God. Does that mean they stop teaching about the power of God and just talk, keep teaching about the love of God? Since there's no power, we can talk about love. This is in my dream, you know, so bear with me a little bit. And then that struck me so hard. So I went back in this dream to the hospital bed and I said, well, I might as well use faith now. And then in the name of Jesus, I commanded the woman to rise up. And I couldn't, I didn't even finish saying it. She got up. And I couldn't find the nurses. Everybody is like this long hallway. So you know what? She was still weak. So I I ran out to go get the nurses. I couldn't find anybody. I came back. She was on the floor. I'm like, oh no, she's not going to die again, is she? You know, I said, don't see anything. They need to see this. So I picked her up on my shoulder and took her to the nurse's station. And they said, oh, the nurse said, well, yeah, she did say that she believed that God's power is on you to raise her from the dead before she died. You know, so this is all in the dream. 
But the point of the dream I'm saying is that even the illustration here is this. We could do mighty things if we would do what the script says. In my dream, I behave like how many of us will behave. I just thought, okay, it's already bad. It's happened. If it was, she was still sick, I'll pray. We did what Mary and Martha did. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even in my dream, I was still thinking like Mary and Martha. When all I needed to do is stand there in the authority of the word of God and exercise my faith. Amen. Now, I have a few more points. Rejoice always. First Thessalonians chapter 5 tells us uh, to rejoice always. And it says also to pray always. Pray without ceasing. You rejoice. When you rejoice, what do you rejoice about? You are bringing stuff that gives glory to God. Now, rejoicing is actually an act of faith. Ed, you were sharing uh, this morning, we were talking about um, Anna. In the Bible, where Anna was praying, and Eli says, Oh, you are drunk. I said, No, I'm not drunk. I'm just pouring my heart to the Lord. And Eli says, Well, let it be unto you as you have desired. And said, From that moment on, Anna stopped being sad. And we were discussing it that that's what faith is. Faith is being able to take God's word for it and change your attitude. And change your words. And uh, you know, you, 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 you were sad. You were saying, oh, I don't know how we're ever going to make budgets. Well, I don't know how we're ever going to keep this, the bills paid. But in the moment you know you receive by faith, you say, thank you, Father. You are my source. Thank you, Father. I know I have everything that I need. Well, oh, well, they, but they just kicked me out of my house. Thank you, Father, because I have everything I need. You keep rejoicing, but it, it's getting from bad to worse. It's all right. Thank you, Father. I've got everything that I need, and you are rejoicing. You're not looking at the circumstances to determine whether you rejoice. You're looking at the Word of God and what's on the inside of you, and on that basis, you rejoice. You pray without season. You, what's my next point there? You don't quit. You don't get on the side of the road and quit. It says, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. I have done everything that needs to be done. You're not designed to fail. You're not designed to fail. Don't, 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 don't look at what the world looks at. And the last point I'm going to uh, share there is, to remember the goal. Remember the goal. One day, the cotton call will come and we will all have to answer. And then we're going to say, oh, well, how did the movie go? <laughs> how did the movie go? Well, the script, that scene was really, really difficult, so I skipped it. Oh, you should have seen it. There's no way I would have made it out of that place. Man, the vampires were there. The, you know, the, you know, the orcs were there. The, you know, from Lord of the Rings. They were there. Everybody was there. And it was difficult. And I was by myself because everybody else quit. So that's why I skipped on that scene. It's too hard. So no, no, no. I wrote the book. Look. I wrote the book. All you needed to do is do what my word says and follow the, your director's leading. Well, it was going to be gold. Now it's stubble. Let's put it to the fire. Oh, oops. No reward. Go to the other side of the... you get lunch after everybody is eaten. You know, I'll wipe your tears away. <laughs> you know, the goal really is not anything material as we see it on this side. I look forward to the day when I've done all that it's called me to do. And it's going to look at me and it's going to say, you've done exactly what I called you to do. That's my goal. That's what I'm looking forward to. That's what I'm looking forward to. I'm not going to let situation or circumstances kick me off of it. And I'm going to wrap up by reminding us what I said at the beginning. Our destiny is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, and that's already done. What we do in life should be an overflow 
of living a satisfied, fulfilled life. A friend of mine, a great musician, I saw, uh, years ago I was pastoring this uh, gentleman at the time at a church in Toronto, and I asked him, I said, what if you never get to play the instrument or lead worship another day in your life? What would happen? You should see the blood drain from his face. I thought I was cursing him. I said, no, 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 I, I'm not cursing you. I just want to know what you... <laughs> Friends, if we are still looking at what we do to find meaning, we haven't known Jesus enough. I said to him, I don't have to preach another sermon in my life. And I'm done. I'm satisfied. I don't have to preach another sermon. Oh, trust me. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Necessity is laid on me to preach the gospel. I have the drive to pre preach the gospel, but not a drive for fulfillment. Is a drive, recognizing the need out there, recognizing that there are people that need to receive the message, that need to understand grace, that need to understand the role of the Holy Spirit in their life, that need to understand how to walk by faith. That's the drive. It should never be anything we do, whether it's for God or for anybody, should never be things we do for us to be fulfilled. We should recognize that in Jesus Christ, we are fulfilled. That when obstacles come, we're not quitting on God. We stand and we keep giving him praise. Amen.